Good morning, or afternoon, or whenever you're listening to this. Welcome to another episode of Not Your Mother's Goose, the bridge back to the stories of your childhood, except with the details and accuracy traded in for snark and Pinocchio jokes. I'm Topher Gog, and coming up today, we'll take a quick snooze with Rip Van Winkle, go on tour with the Bremontown musicians, and we'll have a special guest appearance from Herb from the World of Walt, here to give us the latest insider Disney scoop, including that the Apple stand across from the Snow White attraction has closed due to poor sales. First, though, we're going to start things off a little differently this week. I realized I've been spending all this time writing up these stories, but why? We could just look them up online. And it seems like we ought to cover Alice in Wonderland, so let's just fire up the web browser and see what Alice's Wikipedia page says. So we have here Alice in Wonderland from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. And then there's a little warning. It says, this article, like most of the crap here on the internet, is full of unverified baloney that is barely more accurate than the scandalous meme your cousin posted showing Robin Hood at an ATM with a seven-figure bank balance. But feel free to tell your friends about everything you read here as if you saw it on 60 Minutes, because frankly, we don't give a rip. So on we go. Alice Johnson, born October 8th, 1954, better known as Alice in Wonderland, is a ditzy literary character created by Lewis Carroll or Charles Dickens or one of those other famous British authors. You've never actually read the books, so don't even try to pretend because nobody will believe you. Also be warned, if you try to dress up like Alice for Halloween, you'll probably end up looking like a milkmaid or maybe a character from Little House in the Prairie. Now we have the section, Visit to Wonderland. Bored out of her mind after spending the afternoon with her annoying sister, Alice finds her way to Wonderland, an area about 30 miles west of Topeka. She arrives there in the standard fashion, following a talking rabbit down his hole, downing a beverage that shrinks her to a fraction of normal size, and then slipping through a keyhole that doubles as Wonderland customs. In the process, she also encounters some special cookies that instantly make you enormous. Those are called Oreos. More on them later. Stop number one on the Wonderland tour is a caucus race directed by a dodo bird, where everyone runs around in a circle for hours, sorry, there's no passing, and nobody wins. This is an excellent activity for people who have not yet mastered the finer points of Duck Duck Goose. After taking a wrong turn down Pitt Road, Alice eventually decides she's had enough of this stupid race and heads on her way. She soon meets up with a hookah-smoking caterpillar and later encounters a Cheshire Cat. Here at Wikipedia, we have no idea what a Cheshire Cat actually is, but we bet that seeing it had something to do with Alice hitting the hookah. The next stop on Alice's trip is a rendezvous with Tweedledee and Tweedledum, two boneheads who seem destined to be contestants on the gong show. They apparently enjoy poetry, at least if it involves walruses and or carpenters. At this point, Alice needs a break, so she joins up with a nutjob mad hatter, a different talking rabbit, and a wasted dormouse for a quick tea party. These three make that stoner caterpillar from earlier seem pretty normal. Alice also barfs after riding the spinning teacups. Alice elects to wrap up her day with a quick game of croquet. Wonderland Croquet Supply must have recently gone out of business, though, since this particular game features flamingos for mallets and a variety of hedgehogs in the place of balls. Basically, we're talking about an advanced version of whack-a-mole. For an opponent, Alice draws the Queen of Hearts, who is pretty much Henry VIII, except with a shorter temper and more beheading equipment. Alice would be wise to not actually, you know, win. We now have the section Trial and Escape. Croquet completed, most people would head home and call it a day. Alice, however, gets waylaid when she gets herself put on trial for something or other. In a bold defense plan, she employs the time-honored legal strategy of eating Oreos until she's about a mile tall, then waking up and discovering that the whole thing was a nightmare. She later claims she learned this technique from an episode of The People's Court with Judge Wapner. So that wraps up the page. There are external links if you want to follow them to the Wonderland Tourism Bureau, to OK Croquet Monthly, and the Twitter page for the underscore real underscore Tweedledum. Looks like he's verified, has a blue check mark. Also, categories include people who talk to caterpillars, disappearing cats, and milkmaid costumes. So feel free to check on any of that stuff. That was very enlightening indeed. You just can't go wrong doing your research online. We'll get some more... <clears throat> accurate information when we check out the news next.
They always say that no news is good news. Well, based on the number of actual facts you're about to hear, this should be the best news you've gotten all week. Here are your headlines. Mistyped space turns gingerbread man into gingerbread man, the redhead who sells white and wheat. Sneezy finishes last in hide-and-seek tournament. And today's lead story comes from our philanthropy bureau. Emperor drops off old clothes at Goodwill. Goodwill Industries is stocking its shelves this morning, replenishing its inventory thanks to a generous donation from the Emperor yesterday. I won't be needing these anymore, declared the newly beclothed, or perhaps that's declothed, Emperor, as he strode confidently to the donation box on the corner of Moron Parkway and you're not wearing a darn thing boulevard. He continued saying, Old pants, shirts, robes, stockings, even a crown, you can have it all. I don't even need a receipt. By the way, is there a bit of a breeze today? The Emperor continues to bask in the limelight of his interesting new wardrobe that he debuted last week, though observers are still wondering what the plan is once winter arrives. He also briefed reporters on a follow-up project, the Emperor's new toilet paper, but admitted he probably should hold on to the castle bidet for the time being. It's time now to go to break, but last week's TV listings were so popular, we've brought back Matt Ottinger to tell you about another exciting project that's in the works. Check it out. Coming this fall. As you surely know, we're long since out of ideas here at NBC, so we just keep rebooting our old shows with wacky new premises. Hot off the success of Friends, the one where Rachel dates Rumpelstiltskin, we're bringing back your favorite geriatric foursome in The Golden Girls, fairy tale ending. Join Dorothy, Rose, Blanche, and a 107-year-old Sophia as they find themselves starring in all your favorite fairy tale adventures. From Dorothy Locks breaking into the Three Bears condo in Boca, to Little Rose Riding Hood somehow confusing a hairy wolf for Sophia, You'll be laughing till the Metamucil shoots out your nose. And don't forget to check out Blanche's steamy new boyfriend, special guest star Old McDonald. So block off your Thursdays at 8.30... Oh, wait, right, we had to move it up. Block off Thursdays at about 4.30, right after you get home from Denny's, and come laugh with The Golden Girls, fairy tale ending. We know you can't resist Betty White. Definitely get your DVRs set for that one, or maybe your VCR. Actually, I can't talk. I still own a VCR. Actually, I own two VCRs. Let's move on. Some more breaking news. Cadillac releases new luxury car for dog catchers, the Cruella DeVille. Detroit Lions sign Mufasa to play running back. And this just in, battle rages over Frosty's remains. You may recall when the family of baseball great Ted Williams clashed over whether to put Ted's body into a cryogenic freezer. Their fight, however, pales in comparison to the current state of Frosty the Snowman's relatives, who continue to argue over what should be done with what's left of Frosty after his untimely melting earlier this year. When the five-day forecast made it clear last spring that Frosty was not long for this world, his brother, Chili the Ice-Carved Swan, placed a bucket at Frosty's feet to collect the drippings. These drops are now sloshing around next to a tub of cottage cheese in Chili's refrigerator, much to the dismay of Frosty's mother, Gladys. Gladys became even more distraught upon learning that Chili's maid might have used the bucket when mopping the kitchen floor, meaning that Frosty is now sporting the fresh scent of pine saw and may technically be a half-brother of Mr. Clean. Frosty's mother wants to take custody of the water and give it a proper disposal by flushing it down a toilet. My son doesn't belong in a fridge, he belongs in a septic tank, she declared. Chili, on the other hand, insists that Frosty would have wanted to be preserved in case he could be reanimated for another frolic through town. Chili believes that technology will soon exist that would allow Frosty to be taken to a local ski resort and misted through the snowmaking equipment, reforming him into flakes that could then be rolled and repacked. Hi, hello, it's the boy who cried wolf, here to tell you that Not Your Mother's Goose is the best podcast ever, and I mean it. I'm not just cry- Whoa, wolf, 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 help, help! (laughs) 
the Bremen Town Musicians. Now, we've already done a few Stories You Don't Remember segments on the show, but the ones this week are more like stories I don't remember either. When I initially wrote the Not Your Mother's Goose book, the section for the Bremen Town Musicians simply said, Who the cares? But maybe we can clear this up a little, if I look it up. Or maybe not, at least not in terms of making the title make sense as it appears to me that the Bremen Town Musicians is actually a story about animals busting burglars. And not in Bremen. I'm starting to think that my first version might have been better. But here's how it goes. We've got a crew of four animals, a dog, a cat, a donkey, and a rooster. And if we look at the real Wikipedia, not the Alice in Wonderland wiki from earlier, there's actually a version of this story called The Dog, The Cat, The Different Name for a Donkey, and The different name for a rooster. You can use your imagination. Anyway, these animals are all about to get put out to pasture, or worse, so they opt to leave their farms and go to the number one plan for dealing with a midlife crisis, which is of course to form a rock band. To get this band started, they set off for the town of Bremen, which must have had a bustling scene for rooster music. Thing is, they never actually make it there. Along the way, they wander upon a cottage, peek in the window, and discover a bunch of burglars living inside. Making like an episode of America's Most Wanted, they all hop on each other's backs, make a bunch of noise, and the burglars run away. At that point, the members of the Animal Justice League move into the house, which would seem to just make them Burglars 2.0, but maybe I'm missing something here. That's not the end of the story, though. Stay tuned for the sequel, The Thieves Fight Back. The original Burgling Squad returns, Seriously, I feel like we've got every robber except the Hamburglar involved here somewhere. And they send in a representative to try to retake their stolen spoils. The problem is, this guy gets clawed by the cat, bitten by the dog, kicked by the donkey, and the rooster crows him right out the door. To add to the mess, he thinks he's been clawed by a witch, knifed by a man, yelled at by a judge. I mean, he might as well just have been obliterated by the smoke monster on Lost to save time. He tells his buddies to head for the hills while they still can, and the animals take over the house. Best as I can tell, that is the end of the story. At least until George Orwell comes along to interview them for an Animal Farm sequel. Four legs good, two legs bad. Rip Van Winkle. We go back to see our old buddy Washington Irving, who was the equivalent of the Brothers Grimm of Colonial America stories. He's also the guy who brought us Ichabod Crane a few episodes back. Now this is just the quick version of Rip Van Winkle's tale. I figure we want to get it in before anybody nods off. Rip Van Winkle falls asleep for a long time. You probably remember that part. But do you remember why? Neither do I. Apparently, one day in the 1770s, Rip tells the missus that he's headed out for a while. He goes off for a walk in the mountains, and along the way bumps into a man carrying a giant keg. Starting to look like a good day for the Ripster. He follows this man up the mountain, where they come upon a whole group of dudes doing some good old-fashioned outdoor hilltop bowling. And who are these mystery men, you ask? Well, they're the ghosts of the crew of the famous explorer Henry Hudson, of course. Everyone knows that. And what do the ghost men do? Well, they get old Rip wasted on their booze. As in, pass out for 20 years wasted. He misses just a few things along the way, namely the American Revolution, but also the premieres of most of Mozart's operas, and from what we know of Rip, I bet he was pretty disappointed to not get to see The Marriage of Figaro. But yes, you've got this straight. The guy sneaks out to get away from his nagging wife, doesn't come home for 20 years, at which point in the story she's died, And the best story that he can think up in that whole time is that he got roofied by a team of boozer bowling explorer ghosts. Obviously. Let me know how that one works out for you, Rip. Hey, it's the Gingerbread Man. 
And as long as nobody bites my ears off, you can bet I'll be listening to Not Your Mother's Goose. We've got something very special for you this week. Obviously, there's quite a bit of overlap between the fairy tales that are the heart of Not Your Mother's Goose and the world of all things Disney. To celebrate that, we've got a guest appearance this week from Herb from worldofwalt.com, one of my favorite Disney blogs, mainly for his trips to the parks where he live streams an attraction on Saturday mornings on Facebook. Herb's here this week to provide us with some insider Disney updates, but it is Not Your Mother's Goose, so that means one, it involves fairy tales, and two, it's totally inaccurate. Herb, take it away. Hi, it's Herb from World of Walt, home of the Pin of the Month Club. Normally, you can find me reporting on the latest Disney news at worldofwalt.com or riding attractions while offering shameless plugs on Saturday mornings on Facebook Live. Today, though, I've come across some very interesting Disney news that I want to share. It's not what some in the business would call, quote, accurate, unquote, but that's just a small detail. So here we go with the first ever World of Walt, Not Your Mother's Goose Disney News Report. We start in the parks, where Disney is switching things up with its latest attraction, announcing a planned 2022 opening date of a brand new ride called the Gingerbread Man Jaunt. Located just outside the Magic Kingdom, guests can now skip the line for the monorail and instead hop aboard the nose of a swimming fox for a thrilling ride across the Seven Seas Lagoon to start their Disney day. Imagineers note that they're still working on a few kinks, however, mainly the fact that some of the guests are being eaten about halfway through the trip. In other parks news, Disney announced today that the legendary Tortoise and Hare will hold a historic rematch in the Magic Kingdom next month. Instead of a traditional sprint, though, the two rivals will square off in a line-beater challenge, strategically making their way through the queue to see who can get aboard Dumbo first. The Hare is considered a heavy favorite and is expected to use a pre-booked fast pass to speed to the front. The Tortoise, on the other hand, plans to take the long way in the standby line, which will be rebranded as the slow and steady line for the day. Asked how he thought he could actually win with this strategy, the tortoise was coy. He did, however, hint that he might pay off some cast members to station a Sleeping Beauty meet and greet near the front of the Fast Pass line. Now moving to the resorts, rumors are swirling that Disney will soon expand with a new nursery rhyme themed hotel. Located near the Swan and Dolphin, the Disney Goose will offer a series of rooms branded across a spectrum of Mother Goose characters. The Goose is expected to showcase Disney's signature theming, ranging from Princess and the Pea Suites, with random lumpy objects under the mattresses, to the Tangled Vacation Weekend, where guests can spend their whole trip locked up in a Rapunzel Tower villa. Diehard guests can go to the next level with the Goose's signature immersive package, the Goldilocks Experience, featuring rooms with chairs that are too big and too small, room service porridge that's too hot and too cold, and the chance you'll come back from Hollywood Studios to find a random person sleeping in your bed, you'll feel so bear-like that you could replace Big Al in the Country Bear Jamboree. While no opening date has yet been set, governmental records show that Disney has already filed permits for a resort made out of straw, sticks, and bricks, leading to speculation that the three little pigs have been hired to head up the construction. That will wrap it up for this week's Disney news, but keep your eyes open for more stories soon. There are many Disney dining updates on the horizon, including construction of Hansel and Gretel's all-candy house at Epcot and the upcoming opening of Animal Kingdom's Big Bad Wolf Bistro, where I'm a little scared to see what or who might be on the menu. I'm pretty sure that'll be walk-up dining for the Big Bad Wolf, so the Grandma Special should only cost you one quick service credit on your dining plan. Thanks again to Herb from World of Walt. Be sure to check out his website. That's worldofwalt.com and the World of Walt Facebook page. I personally can vouch that his pin of the month club really is quite a bit of fun if you're a Disney fan. With that, we've almost reached the end of another show. I'm putting the final touches on this a week before Christmas, so I hope that you have a wonderful holiday season and new year. Of course, kind of like I said at the beginning of the show, you could be listening to this in July, so whatever works. Do remember, though, it's never too soon to start picking out Christmas gifts And I've heard that the Little Mermaid has pants on her list this year. Also, the Three Little Pigs and Rumpelstiltskin would both like straw, although for very different reasons. I did ask Aladdin, too, but he said he doesn't really need anything. I guess he's got other options. 
That'll do it for this episode of Not Your Mother's Goose. But do be sure to come back next time as we'll knock on the door with Goldilocks and listen to a group of my friends try to tell their own version of Jack and the Beanstalk on the spot with predictably questionable results. We'll also fire up Rapunzel's jukebox one more time and revisit the Super Bowl of fairy tales, the one and only Cinderella. Thanks so much for listening today. I truly do appreciate you taking the time. I I hope it's been worth it with a few laughs. My name is Topher Goggin. Remember, the goose is loose. I'll talk to you soon with more on Not Your Mother's Goose. To a pod mini original production. Thank you. Pod mini. Thank you. Thanks for listening.